Are you ready to take a journey back in time to the very earliest days of video gaming? Join me right now in Dave's Garage as we explore the history and development of the classic game Pong. We'll take apart a vintage Coleco Telstar console to see how it's made, build a working Pong machine from the vintage chip that we find inside, and I'll show you how to add sound, input paddles, and much more. Then we'll bring it up and demo it on our authentic Zenith Amber CRT. I'll even show you the two secret hidden games I discovered on the chip that were not enabled on the console at all. If you've ever been curious how Pong, that most basic video game of all time, actually works, then you don't want to miss this 70s retro tech adventure. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. By now, everyone's heard of Pong, even if you're too young to have been alive when it was the only game in town. But if you remember before and after Pong, then you can really appreciate what a revolution it truly was. It's one thing to see the game in an arcade, but Pong for the Home did something far more impressive than just play a game. It turned your own television set, that trusted but heretofore one-directional entertainment source, into a suddenly interactive device. Not only were you in charge of the game, but you were also in charge of the game's outcome, and on television. For the sake of accuracy, it's important to note that Pong is the trade name for a table tennis themed sports video game developed and sold by Atari starting in 1972 as an arcade machine. And yet, Pong is not the first of the genre because it is alleged that creator Nolan Bushnell that same year had seen the Magnavox Odyssey's table tennis TV game. According to the actual Pong developer at Atari, Alan Alcorn, Pong itself was a direct response to Bushnell having seen the Magnavox and believing that he could do a better quality version of it. And so, Elkhorn was assigned to develop what would later be known as Pong. I actually spent about 30 seconds googling where the name Pong came from. I figured it must have something to do with the sound effect of the bouncing ball. And then I got it, as in ping pong. Am I like the only person on earth who didn't get that already? If it came as news to you too, let me know in the comments. Maybe there's two of us. Obviously, Pong was widely cloned in those early days. More on that later. And today, we'll be looking at a legally licensed and very popular clone, the Coleco Telstar. Obviously, Pong was widely cloned in those early days. More on that later. And I've got to apologize in advance, because when I'm speaking about a specific machine like that, I'll call it the Telstar. But when I'm talking about the general TV tennis game in general, I'll probably call it Pong no matter who made it. Sorry, Nolan. It's just shorthand these days. If you were around in the day, odds are you had or at least knew someone who had a Coleco Telstar. They made about 3 million of them, and let's have a quick look at what's inside of one. Okay, let me dig through my big old pile of Telstars here to see if I can find one suitable for taking apart. Looks like I've got three bases here. I'm sure one of them should still have a chip in it. We'll find out. All right, here we go. I've got three of these on hand, and I don't think any of them works perfectly. Uh, some of them have video, but no modulation. Some of them lack audio. And so I was unable to get a working one complete, and so that's kind of why I decided to start this project and see if I could make one work on the bench. The basic gist of the marketing is that you can hook it up to any TV. It's got a switch where you can go back and forth from games to TV. It's got three games built in, keep score, and it's got a bunch of different game features. All right, let's get this Telstar open by pulling out the power, flipping it over, and I'll remove the six screws that hold the base to the top. Inside, on the lid side, we find the two rotary controls, the speaker, the selective switches, and the reset button. Those are in turn all wired to a harness which goes to the PCB. And here's a look at a board where I've pried the RF modulator shielding cover off. Now you'll notice there are only a grand total of three chips on this board and there's nothing interesting on this side really, so it's completely reasonable that we should be able to build one of these in a breadboard on the workbench. Back in 1972, Elkhorn was busy working on Pong and they decided to test market their beta version by hand building a wooden cabinet for it and then installing it at a local bar named Andy Capps Tavern. At about the same time, Bushnell flew to Chicago to demo the game for executives at Bali and Midway. Back in the bar, the game was an instant smash hit until it stopped functioning. A tech was dispatched in the Atari emergency van to investigate the cause, and he found that the problem was that the coin box was stuffed so full of quarters that it couldn't accept anymore. As time progressed, the streets in the local area started to take on an abandoned look as people were queued up indoors waiting to play Pong. The Secret Service soon launched an investigation to find out why so many quarters were missing from the local monetary supply, only to find out that Nolan Bushnell had 21,000 US quarters stored in the trunk of his 1972 Buick LeSabre as he tried frantically to collect and store all the money that the prototype was bringing in. 
Only some of those legends are true, but it is true that the machine proved wildly popular with those local bar patrons. That's when Bushnell decided that it would therefore be more profitable to invest in building the machines themselves rather than licensing it to either Bali or Midway. The problem was that he'd already kind of shown it to both of them, but now he wanted to keep the production of the machines in-house without alienating them. What he really needed then was for both companies to decline. So Bushnell came up with what I see as a genius plan. In order not to anger either company, he called both and told them each that the other had passed on it and it was now all theirs if they wanted it. Well, neither called his bluff and both companies passed, so Atari was clear to build it themselves. In fact, Bali CEO Jack Tramiel, later of Commodore 64 fame, reportedly stated, we're looking for something that changes the world and pinball doesn't do that. If it was unfortunate for Bali that Tramiel conflated Pong with pinball, he was not the only one who made that mistake. The next problem was that, as far as the local bankers were concerned, at least at that time in Chicago, arcade machines meant pinball, and pinball meant the Mafia, and so many banks wouldn't touch the idea either. Fortunately, eventually Wells Fargo ultimately extended a line of credit that Atari used to expand and build the assembly line that they needed to fabricate the machines in-house. Those first arcade Pong machines would be built entirely around discrete TTL logic chips. Soon, however, a company called General Instruments would release Pong on a chip, an integrated circuit which would enable devices to be built by the millions. This is the chip that the Coleco Telstar uses, but how does it work and what does it do? Well, let's take a closer look at the Pong on a chip I see. All right, I'm going to do my best Ben Eater impersonation here and take you through the data sheet. It has an optional color chip available separately. There are six games included here, including two rifle games that are not exposed in the actual console. It comes in PAL and NTSC, has automatic scoring, uh, 0 to 15. You can adjust the bat size, the rebound angles, and the ball speed all by changing pin values on the chip itself. You can adjust things like the ball speed, whether you get automatic or manual service, and of course, the game does produce some very fancy beeps and boops that they call action sounds. The hockey or soccer, whichever you call it, has shooting forwards that can deflect the ball, and there is a border around all the games, which they apparently feel is important, and it probably was in the overscan days. Atari's original Pong for the arcade was announced publicly on the 29th of November, 1972. Orders rolled in so fast that Atari had trouble hiring enough people to keep up with the demand for the machine. Pong made it to Japan the next year only to find that Sega and Taito had already released their own clones well before Atari even made it to that market. By April of 1974, Magnavox had discovered some damning evidence. Not only had Bushnell indeed visited the Magnavox offices to play the Odyssey, but they also said he even signed the guestbook. So there was no denying it. Bushnell proclaimed proudly, the fact is that I absolutely did see the Odyssey game, and I didn't think it was very clever. While his lawyers felt he ultimately would prevail, they cautioned him that it would cost about $1.5 million to defend the suit. Bushnell hedged his bets and decided to settle with Magnavox for $1.5 million instead. It was probably a smart move as Magnavox continued with its lawsuits against other companies, like Coleco, that had similarly copied their game, and ultimately Magnavox won. It helped a great deal, no doubt, that Magnavox held at least one critical patent on the idea. If I have properly unwound the history of that patent, Magnavox was involved because they were responsible for the video game licensing on behalf of a defense industry company named Sanders Associates, where an engineer named Ralph Baer had penned the general idea for a video game back in 1966. And so there you go. Pong was a direct outgrowth of the U.S. defense industry at the height of the Cold War. Now, I don't want to get too bogged down in the legal battles and licensing issues, so the main thing you need to know is that the maker of this new chip, General Instruments, ultimately settled with Magnavox out of court, clearing the way for a flood of cheap clones based on their new chip. Let's have a closer look at that chip now. I want to find out what the minimum amount of wiring and work that we can do to get it up and running is. The four corner pins on this IC have no connection normally, but you should not use them as tie downs, which means they should not be tied into the ground plane, I presume. For the remainder of the pins, we'll take a look at the pin descriptions that come on the next page. So pin two is ground. Are you with me so far? All right, then you're doing great. Sound output will go to a small amp and speaker, and here's our positive power input. Pin five controls the rebound angles. Pin six is the video output for the ball itself. That's kind of interesting in this case because each component of the game is output on its own pin. Pin seven is the ball speed, high or low. Pin eight is gonna control whether the ball comes out automatically, and we're gonna want it to so that it works without us having to hit the manual serve button. Pins nine and 10 are the video outputs for the player paddles. Now, the left and right bat input controls the position of your paddles on the screen. The bat size is how big those are. The sync output is the video, both horizontal and the video syncs are output on this pin. 
clock input is where we need to supply a master 2 MHz clock to the chip. That could be a problem. Pins 18 through 23 are intended to select which game you're going to play. They're normally connected to a rotary switch. Pin 24 is the video output for the score itself and the background playfield, border, and the net. There's a game reset here, which resets the score and starts a new game, but doesn't really seem to reboot the whole chip. Shot input and hit input appear to be related to the shooting games that we're not going to be overly concerned with, other than taking a quick look at them later on. Well, it all looks kind of straightforward, but there's one big catch. The chip needs a 2 MHz clock, and I don't have a clock generator module yet. I've got one on order, but as it stands now, I don't have the crystal and inductor and whatever else is actually needed to build a 2 MHz clock. And that's when I realized I could likely use a little microcontroller to generate some sort of 2 MHz square wave that I would then use as a clock. I tried first with the pulse width modulations channels on an ESP32 microcontroller, but I couldn't get them to run at high as 2 MHz. So at that point, I fell back to the old Arduino Uno and with a few lines of code was able to generate a nice and stable 2 MHz clock. All the code does is adjust the timer control registers to achieve the right clock rate and then set the output on the pin 9. I'll then connect the Arduino ground to our breadboard ground and the pin 9 clock output to the clock input on the Pong chip. I'll check the clock with the oscilloscope quickly to make sure that it's a 2 MHz square wave. You can see a bit of noise, no doubt due to the long jumper wires that I'm using, but I imagine it will be stable enough to still run the chip. With the power and clock connected, it's possible that this chip is already up and running, but we have no output connected in any way, so we have no way to know. Connecting the video will still take a bit of work, as we'll see, but we should be able to get an audio signal by just connecting the chip's output to a little speaker. Just as the original did, I'm going to use a 2N2222 transistor to amplify the sound signal a little bit. Along with a couple of resistors, I'll use it to make a little amplifier circuit and connect it to a headphone jack breakout board. Then I'll plug the speaker into that and power it up, and we'll see what we get. And indeed, as soon as I power it up, I hear some beeps and boops in the background, which tell me authoritatively that it is in fact running, or at least doing something in the background. It's alive! Oh, in the name of God! Now I know what it feels like to be God! Well, that's more hyperbole than I would officially endorse, but yes, in fact, it is alive, and it seems to be working pretty well in the background, although we can't, of course, see anything yet. So that's on to our next step. Now that we've got some sound working, it's time to take a shot at the video. This chip does something rather interesting. Instead of outputting its display on a single pin, each major component of the game is broken out onto its own separate pin. The ball is on one pin, and the playfield and score is on another, and the players are on yet others, and so on. That means two things. It means that with a little more circuitry, or with the addition of a helper chip that was available back then, you can color each element separately on a color TV. But it also means that if we're doing a black and white version of the game, as we are, then we need to pull all those signals together into one somehow. We're aiming for good old composite video. As you're likely aware by now, a classic CRT draws its picture by moving the electron gun across each scan line horizontally. After finishing the line, it retreats back to the left edge, moves down the line, and then draws the next line. With an interlace signal, first it draws all the odd lines, then it goes back to the top, and then draws the even lines, but that's not a detail that we have to worry about, fortunately. Our NTSC version of the chip will do that automatically. In order to control where the electron gun is actually drawing, we need to provide two sync signals. One fires very quickly at about 15 kHz to tell the gun when to retrace back to the left edge. A second signal fires 60 times per second, which tells the gun to move back to the top. To make a composite video signal, we will need to combine all of the video outputs that make up the game elements along with the sync signals. We simply feed that to any monitor capable of displaying composite video. We can't just tie the outputs together, however, as they would pull each other's signals up or down. What we really want is to logically or the signals together so that if any of them are active, we draw white, and otherwise we draw black, or don't draw at all. Now, even if, like me, you're not an electronics guru, you probably already know that there are TTL logic chips that can do AND and OR. And the chip used in the Telstar, the 4072, has two four-input OR gates. So we can combine all four of our inputs together by sending them into the 4072's inputs. The output pin of that chip is now our video signal, composed of the ball, the players, the score, and the playfield. All it's missing is the vertical and horizontal sync signals. To get the sync, we'll run the chip's sync output through the other side of the 4072. I imagine this is using the 4072 as basically a buffer that prevents the sync output from disturbing the video signal when we mix them together. By running both the video signals and the sync through the gates, we have a useful signal that we can combine. The video circuit at this point is composed of a few different resistors. 
one on the sync input, the other on the video input, and one tying the whole thing together to ground, which ensures that when the signal is not produced, we get a zero on the output. This lug or junction point is where the video signal is tapped to form the positive side of the composite video output. We then connect the negative or shielding ground side to the circuit's negative side. I'll use an RCA adapter so that I can plug the monitor cable in, and once I do, I'll flip the switch and hope for the best. I'll flip on the main power. Wow, boots fast. No smoke, no fire. So you know what that means. Success. But why did it boot to 1515 as a score? Just a signal end of game and start of a new game? Weird, I have no idea. I was likely as surprised as you were that it worked literally the very first time, complete with the ball score, sound effects working and everything. With the auto service pin grounded on the chip, it continually serves a new ball as soon as the last one is lost. The glaring defect, however, is that there are no paddles. And it's not just in the sense that you can't control the paddles, but they're entirely missing. After some thought, I realized from watching videos of the original game that the paddles can actually go off screen during the game if you turn the knob all the way. Since I don't have any input circuitry at all, odds are it's registering zero, which is off the top of the screen or off the bottom. And so my next step will have to be to create input paddles. According to the schematics, you're supposed to use a 1 mega ohm potentiometer plus a 10k resistor in series with that pot. A resistor capacitor circuit is connected on the ground side of the pot. As you can see, when you turn the pot all the way one way, you get 0 volts, and at the other extreme, you get the full circuit voltage, which is about 5 volts in our case. I lack sufficient background in RC circuits to tell you precisely what it's doing, but my guess is that it's measuring the time it takes to charge up that capacitor. The higher the voltage, the faster that capacitor will charge. So based off the time taken to charge that cap, it knows how far you've turned the paddle knob. That's my guess. If you've got a correction for me or can expand on that explanation, please do so in the comments so we all know. Once I connect the input pots, sure enough, not only do the paddles appear on screen, but our controls work as well. I've connected a push button to the game reset so that when a game is complete, you can start over without rebooting. This game isn't actually Pong, or at least not the tennis version. It looks a lot more like the hockey variant, which is because we haven't told the chip which game we actually want to play yet. The console has a rotary switch that grounds one of the game selection inputs, so all we should need to do is to ground the one labeled Tennis, and sure enough, we get Pong. There are two shooting games that we can enable on the chip, as you can see here. A dot either flies across or bounces around the screen. My guess is that you use a light pen style, light sensing rifle to shoot at the target, and if the pulse you see from the gun comes back during the draw for the bullet, then you know that a hit was made. I'm not sure if this game was ever exposed on any games here in America, though it looks like it might have been used in Europe on the Philips Telegame under skeet shooting. My next step, if there is one on this project, is to build a proper PCB and retrofit it into an original Telstar case. I'd add HDMI output and USB-C input power, so let me know in the comments if there's any interest in me updating and retrofitting a Pong console. If you've enjoyed today's episode, please make sure that you're subscribed to the channel so that you don't miss the follow-up episodes on this and other How Does It Work? technical interest videos. If you have any interest in matters related to autism, Asperger's, or ASD, please check out my book on Amazon, Secrets of the Autistic Millionaire. It's got nothing to do with money and everything to do with living a successful life on the spectrum. It's basically everything I know now that I wish I'd known back then. Now remember, I'm mostly in this for the subs and likes, so please be sure to leave me one of each before you go today. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage.